Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dora, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the most common compliment I ever get on my channel in the comments fields is I'm modest. Whatever people will compliment me in work or in social matters or in life, people will compliment my modesty. They will tell me, Eric, you're so modest, you're so easy, you're so simple, you're so calm. And that's also become the, my biggest point of criticism. I'm constantly criticized in comments fields and online and in social medias for being too superficial and shallow. People assume that because I don't appear to be much, I can't be a lot. I must be then too normal, too simple, too shallow. So I've had to understand and try to figure these things out. How come I'm simultaneously held up as modest and simultaneously held up as superficial or shallow. How are do those two things related and why do people think this about me? I feel one of the most common themes surrounding INFJ personality types is INFJs are supposed to be so special and so unique, you know. And here I am wearing a normal sweater with a regular haircut a white face, no strange scars or gadgets to back me up. What pisses off my haters the most is how ordinary I can appear. I mean, how could anybody so normal be an INFJ? And I'll explain in this video my biggest fear and my complicated relationship to the idea of being strange or special. I'm gonna tell you, I've always known I was different and I've always felt different from other people. I've always known I was different, but I never wanted to say it out loud. When I was a kid, I was too proud of what made me special and what set me apart of other people. And when I talked about it or mentioned it to other people, other people would assume I came from a position of arrogance. They would say, Eric, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than me? And uh, to me, you know, strange never meant better to me. You know, I had a very difficult experience in school when I talked about my own visions and my intellectual projects and what I wanted to do in life and where I deeply hurt another person and uh, made him feel inferior because his visions were more practical. He wanted a normal job, a normal lifestyle, you know. He wanted uh, just to have friends, good friends, you know, a simple life somewhere, doing something easy and relaxing. You know, I came out very much hurt and upset about this. Uh, I felt very bad and very ashamed of myself, you know, for having hurt another person. I hate the thought that I... Uh, ever made other people doubt themselves or feel bad about themselves. You know, everybody is different. Everybody wants different things. But I think when we're confronted by our differences, we're also upset by them and we also get insecure about them. We feel that if we are different, it must be because we are wrong or because we have done something wrong. If somebody is happy doing something, then we must be miserable because we are not doing the same thing, you know. We copy and echo each other, we follow the crowd, we do what everyone else does, we look to others for guidance and, you know, that's why intuition and judging is so difficult. I came to internalize a degree of resentment towards those that tried too hard to stick out of the crowd. I came to think that people who did must be pretentious posters. I came to think that people who had intellectual projects and who talked about them openly and shared them with other people, they, these people, they must be posers, they must be pretentious, they must be uh, trying to get down on other people. So I came to, you know, get stuck on that idea, that crowd mentality that gets us to target witches and to burn people for being different and to get down on people who stuck out in any way. And I came to struggle with this deeply, you know, that fear of being too different and being branded as a witch or crazy or too weird or too strange and to be branded as an outcast for it. Now, I think in part, Sweden is a very difficult country to grow up in if you're special or different. Because in Sweden, there is a law that explicitly states you should not be different. The law of Jante, the Jantelagen, so-called, states explicitly 
warns people from sticking out of the crowd and urges people to fit in and to not stand out, arguing it's better if people are and act more or less the same than if people try to nurture their own independence and their own personal identity. In another way, Sweden is a great country to grow up in as an INFJ because it has had peace for more than 200 years. Because most people there don't argue or have a lot of conflicts. And because most people are very kind and supportive towards one another. What came to trump my feeling that I was special was my need for harmony. And my fear of conflict. I cared too much about other people. And about the group itself. And I did not want to hurt anybody by alienating myself from them. I wanted to maintain my relationships to other people. And so I came to nurture my intellectual projects in secret. I held my own diaries. I wrote by myself. I took a lot of alone time. Because it was hard to be around other people. And to hold back. And to not talk about what was going on inside me. When I was around other people, I would echo other people's interests. I would appear and fake interest in other people's uh, interests. I would uh, dress like them, I would act like them, talk like them, and mimic a lot of their personality traits and quirks. Because of this, I never went through a teenage rebellion like most people. You know, I never developed an alternative fashion style. I never established myself as a symbol of my vision. You know, I hate the idea of making other people feel smaller than me. And I did my best to show people that we were all fundamentally the same. I was not more intelligent, not more empathetic, not more grand, and my style was not better than others. Of course, I think this was a complicated relationship, because I think I went against my own words and actions all the time. I kept being torn between my need to be special and to stick out, and my need to fit in. I came to not know what to do, and partially at times when I... Uh, I would fake intelligence and I would put on a front that was more special and at partial times I would hide myself and cover myself up in any way I could and do my best to fit in. Anything that would maintain harmony and balance around myself and other people, anything that would make me get along better with others and help me reach out to others. I feared that if I was too weird or too strange, I would lose the crowd, you know, when I was talking to people, when I was politically involved, you know, I tried my best to appear like anybody, you know, just like any other person. And so I hoped that in doing so, I would find it more easy to connect to others and to reach other people and convince them. It became a part of uh, building teams and group relationships. I never realized that you could build a group relationship on being different and on sticking out from other people. I never realized that that could be a way to connect with other people or to reach other people. And you know, people's feelings came to matter more to me than my own need to stick out of the crowd. And that became very difficult for me because it also became such a massive drain on my shoulders. Uh, because I had to spend so much energy putting on a quiet and calm front. And, you know, it never worked. I always felt like I, no matter how much I tried, I kept failing to fit in. You know, I kept trying my best to fit in, but I never succeeded. I was always the outcast, always the strange one, always the one that everybody knew and everybody got along with, but who everybody saw as a UFO, UFO. Everybody thought I was weird, everybody thought I was strange, everybody thought I was an outcast. I'd never fit in truly anywhere, but I could get along with anyone. And that became my dilemma. And I think that's... I think that all bottles down to my own fear of being special. What it all bottles down to is I have a major fear of being special, of truly stepping out of the norm and doing my own thing. You know, I fear alienating others by doing so. And I keep wanting balance and I keep wanting peace and I keep fear critics and haters, you know, to get down on me for anything I might say or anything that I might do that is too different. Anybody who follows my channels might know that a lot of my theories on the cognitive functions, my takes on them are deeply different from other takes online. I talk about 16 cognitive functions, not 8. I thought I'd talk about cognitive functions as who you are in flow, not who you appear as or who you act like. I talk about 
personality psychology from the perspective of happiness and what fundamentally makes us happy. I talk about development levels and I talk about different ways of expressing the cognitive functions. I talk about archetypes. And so I talk about things that you never heard anywhere else. But I pass them on as if they're simple things, you know, that anybody knows or anybody has heard or anybody knows or you have seen or read anywhere. I pass them on like it's just like any kind of cup of coffee, you know. You never notice that you're drinking a different kind of coffee. You're, you're expecting, you're coming to my channel and you're expecting to get a, a normal cup of coffee. And what you never realize is, yeah, I'm actually serving you something different. And I've always struggled with this. How do I present my works without uh, alienating myself from other people? And I've seen other people who try too hard to stick out and invent their own cognitive function jargon and their own terminologies and their own images and pictures and illustrations and theories and models. And I've seen how they, <coughs> sorry, I've seen how they cut themselves off from other people and how nobody can, nobody pays an interest to them. Nobody cares about what they do. And that's been a fear of mine, you know, uh, I came to rate the value of my own work, not by how original it was, even though that was important to me, but by how much it came to reach other people. And that meant, you know, I wanted every video I made to leave an impression on other people and to bring understanding and acceptance to others. The more people came to appreciate themselves after watching one of my videos, the better the video. The more people came to feel more at peace with themselves and happy about themselves, the better the video. The more that I felt that people could relate to what I was saying, the better the video. Of course, I also came to harbor a degree of resentment towards my own work as I felt that it was repetitive and stale and too predictable. I felt that I kept repeating myself and I get annoyed with myself whenever I repeat myself. I hate repeating myself. I always want to have something new to offer, you know. I want to be the YouTube channel where everybody can expect something new every day. You know, I deeply crave to feel connected to other people and to make sense to others. I'm sensitive to other people and their feelings and their needs. And I note this when I'm starting to sound like a, U a UFO. I note this when people don't listen anymore. I note this when I've cut people off. I note this when I've made people feel worse with what I did. And I immediately switch my topic or channel or communication when people do. I immediately adjust and change myself and start speaking it differently to help the other person. I'm a counselor first in the sense that I'm trying to guide other people and to teach other people and walk them through something before I'm an independent or a visionary who is too complex or too crazy or too out there for anybody to understand them. Still, I will admit, I've always felt frustrated when people have come to my channel to judge me on the surface and to assume that I must be a shallow or superficial person. It's always been hard for me when people comment that, no, he's not a real INFJ, he's uh, too simplistic, you know, he's too... Uh, modest, he's too normal, he's too shallow, his work is never deep enough, you know, there must be more metaphors, there must be more dilemmas, more complexity, more analytical prospects, there, it must go deeper, you know, so he must be some other personality type, and, you know, they never dare to say which one they think I am, perhaps ISFJ, perhaps ESFP, you know. That's always what I felt that people have been going towards. And uh, yeah, no, I'm not the ESFP entertainer archetype. I'm not an adventurer. No, I'm not uh, somebody who likes to be in the spotlight. No, I don't like to uh, be everybody's friend. No, I don't like to, uh, you know have discipline and organization around me, I'm not neat or clean, you know, no, I'm not uh, just uh, like anybody else, you know, people don't get it, some people don't get it, you know, these people who assume so, they don't know how to read people, they read people based on the surface, not based on who they are, 
And I think uh, when you're an INFJ, it's quite common to be told you're not a real INFJ. I think uh, most INFJs have been told they're not actually real INFJs. You know, most people, have, INFJs, confuse other people on their own identity because they are too much of a chameleon. Fundamentally, deep down, I care more about mental topics, philosophy, literature, fantasy, dreams, ideas, and visions. That's my engine. That's who I am in flow. I'm the most in flow when I'm reading through large books of fantasy novels. I'm the most myself when I can sit down and write down theories and work on ideas. And I'm the most myself when I'm just walking outside on my own, you know. Uh, just fully immersed with the thought about something or a vision or just just in my own uh, what my parents would come to call twilight zone and I think if you're special you're special that's all there is to it you don't have to prove it to anyone you don't have to make a big deal about it it doesn't mean you're better than anyone else Everyone has something that makes them special, and I believe it is possible to nurture and to realize your visions and intellectual projects while helping support and admire the projects of other people. You can recognize your own path without judging other people for their path. You can admire and hold respect for other people for where they are going without becoming envious of other people, without looking down on other people, without making assumptions about them or who they are. I believe as an INFJ you should always seek to nurture a sense of humanism. And uh, that's also about uh, recognizing not just your intellectual aspirations but the future of humanity. You know, any idea or any project that you work towards while feeling disconnected from other people will leave you feeling empty, will leave you feeling like you're disconnected, will leave you feeling alienated, will leave you feeling like you're never going to fit in anywhere. And I think essentially what you should ask yourself is, how will this benefit the human race? What am I doing for other people? How am I helping other people with what I'm doing? And you should find a way to balance your intellectual aspirations with your humanist values. Find a way to build your own path and to make your own dreams come true while supporting other people in their ability to do the same. And I think you recognize deep down that you're an idealist and a part of the human race, not an alien, but one of billions of voices and minds working side by side, trying to find peace and acceptance of others. Stop trying to judge people for appearing superficial or too modest or too shallow and start holding them in your own mental space as if they were brothers and sisters cut from the same tree. Grow beyond the idea that just because you are special, other people cannot be. And I promise you, I will keep working on my own fear of being different, and I will work on staying true to myself and not be too afraid to stand out. So what I believe is INFJs exist on a pendulum, on the special versus the harmony pendulum. Special INFJs, they believe they are different from other people. They have known for a long time they are different and they don't mind. They appreciate standing out. They go their own way. They nurture independence. They fight in relationships and with other people for the right to go their own way. When asked to conform, they have always been rebels and outcasts. They have always gone their own way. They've always done things differently. They've always uh, built their own path for themselves. On the harmony end of the pendulum, you have the harmony-oriented INFJs, and they've always been very introspective and peace-oriented individuals. They've always focused on their understanding and awareness of others and of themselves, their own emotions and emotions of others. They've been focused on their values, who they are, who other people are, and on their relationships, you know, minimizing conflict, spreading peace, making people feel harmonious and balanced, spreading comfort and making people relax, making people feel understood, making people feel appreciated. So on this pendulum you have those that let their need of harmony go too far and so end up denying themselves and holding back themselves and their own identity. 
And then on the special scale, you have those that go too far and those that become pretentious and who come to develop a fake sense of grandiosity that comes at the expense of other individuals. So now my question to you, INFJs, is where do you fall on this scale? How do you feel about your own identity and the needs and the balance of yourself and other people? Have you developed a stronger sense of humanism or have you developed a stronger sense of vision? How are you on reaching your own individual utopia? How long are you on your own intellectual projects and dreams? So tell me more in the comments down below. Thanks everyone for watching and hope to see you guys in the next video.